Friends, we'd like to invite you to join our new contest, Trades Without Borders. I want to interview a trades professional in every state, and I need your help doing so. Each state will only get one trade, so be the one to proudly represent yours. So far, Kentucky has the window and gutter cleaning, Indiana has roofing, and soon Alabama will have auto mechanic. But not to worry, I'm told there's lots more states out there, and we want to hear from you. Message us on Why the Trades Facebook page, and we can zoom you in. And yes, we'll work with your time zone because we care. Look forward to meeting everyone. All right, that's right, kiddos. It's Field Trip Thursday, and we podcast pioneers have packed up our lunches along with the studio to learn why bourbon and bluegrass have become so synonymous. Now get out your permission slips and make a single file line to another episode of Why the Trades, the podcast that dives deep into the minds of these successful people that chose a trades as career pathway. I'm Clellan Russell, your host and advocate for the trades for over 25 years. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Proclaim Roofing and the Window Ninjas, both companies founded and operated right here in Louisville, Kentucky. I'd also like to thank the man that's making science and life fun by filling our minds with those fine, fine spirits, the master distiller, Mr. Hunter Coffey. Hello, Hunter. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good, man. I appreciate you being here. Uh, Now, listeners, Hunter uh, has been the master distiller at Three Boys Farm Distillery in our beautiful state's capital, Frankfort, Kentucky, for 10 years now. Is that right? Yes, sir. And you look too young to be a master distiller of 10 years. I hear that a lot. Is that, is, I, I'm guessing that this copper still behind me is like a fountain of youth. Is uh, that, it must be. Uh, <laughs> well, getting started when you're pretty young, too, helps yeah. a lot, too. Heck, yeah, it does. Well, well your experience, you're wise beyond your years. And I would also normally say thank you for being here, but we are in your house. So thanks for having us. Thanks for having me. And uh, this is an absolutely beautiful uh, distillery out here on, what, 150 acres? It's 126. 126, and it's a, it's a beautiful history. And, in fact, I want to uh, kind of plug the distillery real quick. It's uh, absolutely wonderful people, Walter and Dana Zausch, the owners. Um, uh, they actually helped us out on a nonprofit event, which is how we met you guys. And you do tours, tastings, events, anything else that I'm forgetting? That's pretty much it. Pretty yeah, much it. Yeah. Uh, just making bourbon and uh, – Making good bourbon. Doing tours. Heck yeah, nice. So do you like, are you, I know you're the distiller, do you get tied into any of the tours or the marketing, anything? That kind more of often than not, yes. You don't uh, really, really but now I'm, I'm trying to get uh, a little bit more removed and focus more on production now. So, yeah. Well, you guys are expanding. So, I mean, I, I would assume that you, that you can do what you're good at, your trade, and then Walter can handle the rest of it, right? Right. Is that kind of how and things are going Finding go? people to fit in. <laughs> right. That's a hard part needs. sometimes, uh, finding people to fit in. Uh, and also, too, I want to touch on, I was even thinking about this, driving down your, your beautiful driveway and looking over all the acreage uh, as far as a bonus of the trades is, you know, this is your office. Right. You know what I mean? I don't think, for most of us, I don't think we're, as humans, geared to sit under fluorescent lights in front of a screen all day long. So I think that's a testament to, to the trades is that you do get to get outside, you get to go job to job. And it makes time go by, and you think about what you get to do here right. every day. Um, although I'm curious, um, do you, you know, I'm not saying this just to get free bourbon later. Uh, I say this in sincerity. Uh, you are a rock star of trades. Um, and I know, and we'll talk here shortly about the, the, the ever-growing uh, market of, of bourbon, but relatively speaking, there's not a ton of distillers. Uh, and so for two, you have gotten in so young and to be so successful at it, is wonderful um but do you get tired of it i mean does it does all of this just turn into a job and some days you're like Ugh. i mean everyone has any job you have is going to be you're gonna have those days yeah it's going to really test you but more often than not it's pretty great um, yeah. get to meet a lot of unique different people oh, throughout the whole too. time yeah yeah uh People are usually pretty interested in what you have to say, so it's kind of nice to have a captive audience most of the time, too. <laughs> well, it's funny that you say that because I was even thinking about that, that rock star lifestyle you're living in that, like, how many people you tell them what you do, they just trap you in a corner. and they just, Do they just feed you all of their bourbon knowledge? They try to, <laughs> or, that, or they try to convince me I'm not. So. <laughs> right, right. So it, it happens a lot, too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's the, the security of the, of the distillery right there out the door. My dad's actually coming down with a track hoe right now to drop off. Oh, nice. Now, he does heavy equipment, right? Yes. We might pull him in here one day and, and sit him on the podcast. Yeah, he's actually digging some electrical lines. Oh, there you go. We'll, we'll get some live shots of that. Uh, all right, so let's get into uh, – I, I want to kind of start the, the show with – and we had talked about this prior – 
but the competitiveness and the growth of this industry, um, you know, the, the bourbon trail is, is, as you said, gone from what, eight distilleries? No, it sold to in 2007, it was at six. Oh, and okay. now it's at 18. 18. And explain to our listeners the, what the bourbon trail is. Uh, it's, uh, it's mainly going to be your bigger distilleries. It's going to have uh, more money, basically. Yeah. Um, but then other than that, you have the craft trail, and it has 23 on it currently, too. But oh. they're always growing. Yeah. Um, right now, we're currently with the KDA, and we're about to get on to uh, attempt to get on to the craft trail also. Nice. Um, and you say there's the state's up to, what, 69, 70 distillers? Uh, I think last time it was like 72. Oh, wow. But that was like from last year, so it's hard telling what it's actually at now. All right. And are those mostly craft distillers? Mo- mainly moment? craft. Which is interesting because, you know, I'm, I'm more of a beer drinker and not just full full disclosure. Uh but it's, you know, I'm used to the craft beers, but, I, you know, we and I were talking and you mentioned like all these craft distilleries and this would be considered a craft distillery, right? Yes. Correct if I'm wrong. And that's just, it's a crazy concept because it seems like to distill, you need these huge pieces of equipment, buildings and, and thousands of barrels, but that's really not, doesn't seem to be the case. Right. It's a, uh, so there is no like definition of craft, uh, mm-hmm. but the kind of do a guideline of how many barrels you produce right. uh, and that's usually the cutoff oh, okay. i can't remember it's i think 100 under 100,000 barrels so oh, way wow. under that so yeah, yeah so do you aspire to to get beyond that no yeah it'd be tough well more overhead more headache that that and a lot of limitations at this current site too where we couldn't yeah. even do that if we wanted to oh yeah so would you ever want to move sites uh, not really. Yeah, uh, so I, I kind of like awesome. keep yeah. it small. Heck yeah, heck yeah, and to keep that quality. Uh, so why the popularity? I mean, why? I mean, um, bourbon's been around forever. There's there's a lot of different things that people think it is. Uh, one is uh, tourism in general uh, has dro- uh, drove it a lot too. Right. Because uh, you make bourbon anywhere in the United States, but everyone comes to Kentucky to tour it. Right. Um, Which is good for us. Right, and good always enjoy state. that part. Yeah. Uh, Cocktails is another one. Big boom in cocktails. Oh, yeah. Um, making old fashions and stuff like that. Right. Uh, another one would be uh, this where they've ex- started to open up exporting bourbon to outside the country is really blew it up, too. Yeah. I've heard China is a huge... China, cons- Australia is huge. Oh, yeah. So uh, Australia, they're all drinkers, I'm pretty sure, but... You know. Well, you can see on the vending machine, uh, vending machine on the side of the road, you can buy Jack and Coke. Really? And... and uh, wild turkey and coke wow that's where we need to go next um uh, so as far as uh you think cl- the classes i know that because you all teach some some bourbon classes right tasting yeah and, we do some and, stuff uh with uh Stave and thief uh, that's what it is and explain what that is because i actually did one of those classes with you guys and it was it was amazing um it's just maybe general knowledge of Bourbon, and not just bourbon, also other whiskeys, too. All right. Um, just kind of learning the class, uh, classifications, where it came from, and uh, kind of all aspects of that. So you can kind of, everyone kind of has a base knowledge of it. Right, and it's and it's a pretty big spectrum, though. Oh, it's huge. Yeah, and, and even we got in and even, like, the, the taste buds and different taste buds will, will that, that's register. That's Walter loves doing <laughs> yeah. that. He taught that class, in fact. Um the so as far as uh, difference between bourbon and whiskey, I, I know um, you get so that you, a lot. you do have your guidelines. Uh, so it has to be fifty one percent corn at least, uh, be made in America. It has to not come off the still more than one hundred sixty proof. Can't uh, enter the barrel more than one hundred twenty five proof, and uh, has to go into a new oak barrel, a new charred oak barrel. All right, um, and it does not have to be white oak. Uh, it can be red oak, French oak. Right. Hungarian oak. Does that does, affect the taste? Uh, it, different regions affect the taste for sure, yeah. um, but it has to just be charred oak. Yeah, and that's and those are the stipulations. Is and that's what dif- differentiates between bourbon and whiskey. Right, and there is no a lot of people think there's a time stamp on what what can be called bourbon, and there's not. Uh, mm. For Kentucky straight bourbon, has to be two years. Uh, for non age dated, has to be past four years, and that's really the only time uh, times that have to be uh, met. So two years minimum for, uh, it to be for bourbon. Kentucky straight bourbon, Kentucky but it can be bourbon. bourbon. Like Jimmy Russell always used to say, if you had a cup, uh, an oak cup that was charred on the inside and stood at the still as it came off, put in that cup, then it would have bourbon. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Uh, so as far as the a day in the life, um, this, this is a question that I like and that we always go to, but 
uh, for you, I kind of switch it more like, how do you make bourbon? Because I feel like that is your day. <laughs> so so it depends on where you want to start. Right. Um, you want to we'll go through, because it's multiple days go into that process uh, right. from cooking to distilling, uh, if it's just fermenting. So there's different days in there. But if I was all going to do it all one day, then obviously start with grinding the grain up. Uh, then it'll go into the cooker. And then once it's in the cooker, I uh, already have water preheated to 180 degrees, drop the corn in first, uh, get the corn to uh, 200 degrees, break down those starches. As soon as they're broken down, cool back down to 180, have my rye or my wheat, let those starches break down, then cool on down to 145. At 145, I'll add in the malty grains. Malt's going to break down those starches and the sugars. So it's going to be really sugary corn at that point. Uh, then uh, cool on down to 85 degrees. I have my yeast. Yeast going to break down those sugars and the CO2 and alcohol. So it's fermenting at that point. Then it's going to ferment for three to five days, depending on what the mash bill is. All right. Then once it's done fermenting, uh, it'll top out around 10 to 12% alcohol content at that point. It'll go into the still here. So it's a 650-gallon Vendome pot still, running six-column plates. Um, so you're just basically heating up the, the mash, and it's going to separate the alcohols at that point. All right. Uh, I can go more depth if you want. Well, no, no, that, that gives me an idea. I, I can't do it still on my own. I would revert to you. But uh, as far as, like, your day-to-day, -day, I mean, is that is it is it a process where you can you have to get up in the morning and you start a certain certain route and you do exactly the same thing or can you start in the afternoon and how does all that flow together depends on how much sleep you want to get um <laughs> usually it's, it's, it's longer processes uh right. from, i do everything a little bit slow here um so it's going to be 12 to 16 hour days oh wow um so seven days a week uh here soon it'll be seven days a week See, i actually just hired on someone else to help me out Oh, man, are you going to trust them to take over your well, That's your why baby? they're going to be under my yeah. watchful eye for a while. <laughs> right, for a long while. Because uh, that's what I was even actually going to ask you, because, you know, I grew up on a farm. A lot of my families were farmers, and farmers don't get days off. You know, the, the, the crops, the cows, you know, they always need attention. And I would think that this would be a lot of the same concept. Like, you know, you, you're, you have something cooking, you can't, all right, I'm going to go to the beach for a couple of days, and I'll right. be back. So does that... Uh, does that bother you? Does that hamper you or your lifestyle? I mean, how does uh, I just work? schedule it out to where I, right. if I know I'm going to go on a trip, I know I won't do a cook. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. I've always halfway been good at it, but yeah. my wife put out, uh, pointed out this year that I did the same thing as last year. It's like to get a cook, and I was end up distilling on Christmas Eve, and yeah. I've done that two years in a row now. Because yeah, you messed up your timeline. That or just trying to avoid the in-laws. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, bourbon will help with that, I promise you, uh, whether you have to make it or not. Um, all right, well, that answers those questions. As far as getting into types and costs of schooling, if there is, I mean, you know, how do you, how do you get into this? How did you learn this trade? Uh, that's, <laughs> that's a story hard to tell without uh, being very colorful with my language. Right. Um, I got into it in a very unconditional way of moonshining, um, but there's – opportunities now in college to actually go to school for fermentation or oh, okay. actually distilling processes or other aspects of distilling or in just the distillery distillery aspects um now there's those now i'm not sure what those entail now because right. i never went to any of them all right and then there walter's really uh uh involved with uh, moonshine university they hmm. offer classes that have all aspects and have people really? with where uh, is that is that like it's national? usually a, a, uh Usually it's held in Louisville, oh, okay. um, but sometimes on site at different distilleries too. Wow, nice. So do I, don't, I should have done my research. Do traditional colleges, will they start offering these kind of classes? Uh, they've been, I know Midway has been offering uh, distillery certificates for the last, I think, three or four years. Um, mm -hmm. And UK and Louisville started doing stuff too. Wow. Well, you know, that, that right there is the colleges, I think, trying to get more competitive and realizing – you know, hey, there's a market here. You know, kids are going to want to learn about this kind of thing. Um, well, that's, and then do you know, last question on that, but do you know, is it expensive? Uh, I, have, I, so I haven't yeah. looked at it or anything like I that. And but, I should have done my... <laughs> but uh, I know like, most of your distillers, especially if you're going to a big distillery, they want chemical engineers, and I know that yeah. can be pricey. Yeah, yeah that's way more expensive. Uh, and it's, 
once you become a chemical engineer, you lose all your personality. So <laughs> uh, we've had a few come by. And some not, most times they're pretty fun. I'm just kidding. I have engineer friends. Whoever's listening to this, um, license versus non license is there is there a requirement uh, for actually running? Still no, but the site actually has to have a permit. Oh, okay. Have to have a DSP. Um, they also have to. Uh, my dad just walked in. So he just distracted me. Hey, Dad. Um, Your son's going to be even more famous, just so you know. So, uh, <laughs> with time. Uh, so, uh, there's, uh, lost all train of thought now. Uh, your uh, dad but, wants you to support him. Yeah, that's. <laughs> that's another podcast. That's, that's a whole other, <laughs> whole other thing. Uh, yeah, I've already forgot where we were. Uh, 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 license versus non license. Oh, so you have to have a DSP, obviously, right. to actually uh, distill and actually make spirits legally. Uh, and that's where they can actually tax your alcohol that you're making. Because uh, anything that's untaxed is going to be like moonshine, it's going to be uh, illegal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you had mentioned, I thought this was really interesting because um, I breezed past the union question, but you're like, no, there's. I think it's local 223, the uh, Food and uh, Beverage uh, Union. So uh, 227. Or 227. Uh, so 227 is one uh, that's at Wild Turkey, but every distillery has different ones too. Uh, oh, um, like really? Four Roses has three different unions. Oh, um, wow. Each one of their sub, oh, okay. like distillery has a union, the maintenance shop has a union, and the boiler people have a union. Wow. So they, they're they very complicated over there. So why? I would think you would, uh, the unions wouldn't be as strong being so separated. So I, I have no idea why it's split up in threes. Yeah, that's um, crazy. And then every distillery has their own union as far as just the work and you know, everything else? Usually some of them have the same ones, but yeah. um, they're kind of spread out across. Wow. Wow. Uh, a wide, a right away, uh, wide array of uh, unions. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and then I assume there's there's pension in there, just like any union. Pensions, but usually security. like how most of your pensions are now, they're not really worth it. Yeah, you worry um, about where they're going to be in a little you're while. You're more worried about your 401k. Yeah, it's like the teacher's union, which is fleeting. Um, well, that's interesting. Now let's get into um, the hierarchy of what you do. I know you had said there's – People butt heads over being called a master distiller versus a head distiller, and then you have tasters and uh, barrel makers and everything else. Kind of walk us through the the family of of bourbon bourbon makers. So it's so it's all like because you just don't have like here at the distillery. So you still you're gonna have your well, you can have a cooker and you can have uh, a distilling assistant, distiller, head distiller. Um, head distiller, master distiller, it's whatever they like to be called. Uh, then you got your bottling team, you got your tour, uh, tour uh, team, and you have your gift shop team. And it's just a bunch of little subgroups in there too. All right. Um, but then you got your cooperage, uh, that's going to be, your cooper's going to be making the barrels. Yeah, that's which your barrel maker. That's in high demand right now. Oh, um, yeah. most of your coopers are out, f- uh, four to five months right now. Oh, and wow. Getting barrels in. So, because that would disrupt the whole flow of it. I mean, what yes. happens if you run out of barrels? Uh, so, most of them will make a contract to say, I want this many barrels this year. So, oh, okay. if you're trying to get into it and order barrels right now, like 10 at a time, almost impossible. Wow. They might be able to fit you in if you slide them a little extra money. But other than that, uh, it's pretty rough. So, do the big guys squish the little guys? I mean, I would think. Um, well, usually, rid them out. I mean, <laughs> when they're ordering 280, uh, well, right, they're doing. Yeah. Well, so Wild Turkey, they were doing, I can talk Wild Turkey because I've been there. Uh, I worked there. Um, Wild Turkey's doing around 420 barrels a day right now. Oh, wow. Um, and they're, I think, the fifth or sixth biggest uh, producer. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's a lot of barrels going through. Yeah. Where I would go through maybe uh, 25 a month. Oh, wow. And then what do you all do? With Not a month, I'm sorry. Uh, 25 a, a week. 25 a week. And what do you do with them after that? I know you, some people make furniture out of them, tables. That's very trendy. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> uh, beer is another is a big one. Really? Um, wine and oh. uh, furniture. Man, no kidding. Uh, beer? Oh, yeah. Wow. Stouts mainly. Oh, wow. That's why maybe that's why I don't – I'm not a huge stout fan. So does every stout go through a bourbon barrel? Uh, majority do. Wow, no kidding. Imperial stouts. This is yeah. why I talk to the experts. A bunch of your L's are too. Even sour L's are really? put into a barrel. Wow, that's crazy. Um, I thought they just came out of a spigot. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> sorry, bad joke. Um, as far as the, uh, and I thought this was really interesting too. Um, 
kind of getting back to the pay, I know people always say, well, what can I make? And I know you said there's a pretty big, between the craft distilleries, the huge guys, and then all the people in between, and then the hierarchy of, of all of the employees, it's a pretty big range. Uh, but let's go with the distillers, the master distillers, head distillers. Uh, kind of walk us through, um, kind of walk us through the the, the payoff for the, for the big guys and the little guys, and kind of how they operate. Uh, it's uh, depends on are you just talking about your lead head distillers, yeah, or are you talking about even like your assistance mm, techs? Let's go with assistance and techs too, because people got to start somewhere. Uh, so usually those are ranging anywhere between uh, thirty two to around fifty. Um, right. Then your lead or head distillers be anywhere from sixty to. 150. It just kind of oh, depends wow. on yeah. uh, sky, uh, size, scope, knowledge. All right. But you had mentioned um, that basically, like the the pros and cons, the big versus the little. Like um, the smaller craft places, you have more obligation, mm-hmm. more work to do, but you make a lot more money. The big places have a lot of automation, and they they right. have a lot of people that are doing things for you, but it waters down your pay. Is that about right? Or yeah, because it's your it's most of your big, bigger uh, places, they don't really have a head distiller. It's mainly distiller operators. That's oh. actually watching those computer screens and oh. going through stuff. Then you're actually like head uh, distiller will come in and kind of taste things as it, see how it's going along. Right. Um, and they usually end up doing like barrel picks and stuff like that. That's mainly what they're off doing, spending time and promoting. They're more ambassadors than anything. So how do you get that job? Because I would think that would be pretty coveted. Putting the time in. And just putting the time in. And is that where you want to go? Or being in a family. Is that, yeah, nepotism. That always helps. Um, do you want to go there one day? Do you want to be that, that guy? That seems really boring to me. Yeah, I know. It's Well, you know, it kind of takes some of it out of it, you know, the schmoozing and the selling, mm-hmm. and it's just like I want to do They'll tell you it gets old, too, really yeah. quick. Oh, yeah, everything does. Um, so as far as give me one pro, one con of working, because you worked at the Wild Turkey for a long time. One pro, one con of working for the big guy. Um. Pro, it's you're pretty safe. I mean, it's job family security. job security is there. Yeah. Um, you are also in a union, so it's, oh yeah, uh, security is there. Your steady increase in pay is always there. Um, get your vacations and everything too. Yeah. Uh, negative. You don't, you don't have to distill on Christmas Eve, maybe. Right. It, <laughs> Oh, well, there. Some uh, people uh, run yeah, you too. Know. Yeah, that's right. Um, because most of your stills will run twenty four seven at those bigger places, and most people drink all through the holidays too. Uh, so, con of the big places, just that it's a big place and you get kind of lost. Um, yeah, you're, you're you are just a number there, and yeah. very easily replaced. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's thought there's not a lot of skillful positions. There are very skilled positions, but it's just not. Uh, it's very easy to bring someone in, train them for a couple weeks, and then they're plug in place yeah, yeah, yeah would you find do you find there's a lot of loyalty as far as job loyalty and people sticking it with sticking I with it feel there would be if there wasn't a union yeah. um, because oh, okay. people could actually be rewarded yeah. for actually working hard and putting in the extra time and stuff but i think the union subtracts from that yeah uh, and that way you are basically just a number yeah and it's the pit like to pit the company against the union a lot too oh wow so i assume that about why you gravitate towards the craft side I assume there's no union. No, is there? There's not a union here, right? There's not a union here. No, <laughs> I think so. I'll talk to Walter. We'll try to get one going for you. Um, all right. So the physical constraints, uh, just th- th- of being a distiller, your day to day. I always like to touch on that, just for people considering this. You know, working inside, working outside, heavy lifting. Uh, walk us through some of your your some of your physical requirements of doing this. Uh, it, every day is a little bit different, and that's also. Like to look, uh, talk about a con there at a big distillery is the monotony of it because oh, you yeah. are doing the same yeah. thing it's every single like a, day. Kind of like a factory style. Yes, yeah. it is very much so. And where here it's different every day. I mean, it's I'm always in all the aspects, uh, doing all different kinds of stuff. Like I was on a skid steer for eight hours today, oh, uh, doing moving what? stuff around and just shifting stuff around the the the, the distillery. Shift stuff around, moving stuff, yeah. getting uh, stuff ready for other projects. Right. Uh, so would you say you have to be, I mean, obviously you're physically fit, but do you need to be to be in this job? Uh, d- I mean, it depends on what uh, what aspect you're going to go into. Like if you're going to be a dear God or distilling is really not that too labor intensive unless uh, you have to dump a lot of bags, of grain bags. Oh, yeah. It depends on recipes, stuff like that, uh, how you're going to get grain in, bulk grain in. Right. Um, that's usually the most 
uh, labor intensive part of it. Yeah. Moving barrels around, like I said, if you go into a warehouse, that aspect, I was in a warehouse uh, being a crew leader for a year and uh, that's pretty strenuous. Um, yeah. Handling 400 plus barrels a day. Yeah. yeah. Um, and do you, is that, mo- I mean, you ever, you're not moving around by your hands, are you? By hand. Oh, you are? Yeah. And how much is a, how much does a barrel weigh? It's full of barrel. So a full barrel is going to be right around five hundred fifteen pounds. How do you how do you move? I mean, you so that's why barrels are shaped the way they are. They're oh, yeah. they're shaped to be able to be moved easily. Oh wow, interesting. Well, we gotta you gotta get them get gotta get the alcohol moving. So it's uh, that's um that's really interesting. I never thought about that. Um, so as far as you know, working inside, working outside. I assume there's not a whole lot of work outside, right? There's usually not. Uh, it also depends on the size of the distillery yeah. um, where. Usually a bigger still, you're going to have really defined roles, uh, and you're only going to do a certain job. Where in a smaller place, you have a lot more uh, wide range of responsibilities where half time I'm outside working on the boiler, or yeah. getting uh, chucking wood into the wood boiler, um, working on the road, right. which needs it right now. And <laughs> right. Oh uh, yeah, that, that's now. Do you get have to get into any like electric or plumbing or I mean, because I'm looking around, your your office looks. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of science going on here. A lot of a lot of different things that I don't understand. I know the end result is fantastic, um, but is there any of that kind of of your day to day? Very minimal or electric no? work because uh, most of it has to be done by no license. certified licensed yeah. person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, plumbing, uh, kind of the same stick, uh, unless it's just simple soldering. Yeah, and oh, I, nice. anything over an inch and a half, I really don't solder because yeah, yeah. I need multiple more hands. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, because I'm looking at all these copper pipes. So you can do that soldering, though, Yeah, on the right. smaller stuff. Cool. I think everyone should learn how to solder. Yeah, well, it's like welding. I mean, think about how – I mean, that's a huge, huge industry that people are not going into. Um, so what would you say as far as the, the rest of the um, – as far as the last question about physical requirements, but the, the rest of the, the positions in this industry, is there – I would think a barrel maker would be pretty tough, but is there a specific job that's like, man, I would not want that one? Um. Working in the warehouse can be pretty, pretty uh, labor intensive. Like I said, you're handling 400 plus barrels a day. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you work. Usually you're forced into overtime, um, and so you're handling around 600 uh, oh, wow. barrels a day. Yeah. Uh, it can be, it can be a lot sometimes, and, and depending on, especially because you are outside the whole time too. Yeah. So and it can be really cold. It can be really hot. Uh, yeah, because I've been, we've done enough tours to know uh, those warehouses get. They're not air conditioned, right? No, <laughs> I didn't think they're heated either. Uh, the I thought this was, and then last, any ladder work? There no, no real ladder work in this, other than I guess the. Um, usually, no. Uh, most stuff is going to require a ladder. Is going to be done by, like, when someone comes and works on the steel, they're going to be you're going to have Vendome come in and work on the steel. The people that right. made it. Oh, okay. um, usually, no. There's no ladder work, but being a small distillery, though, uh, there's times I have to get up on a ladder and. And work yeah. on stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this kind of, like I said, depends on the size. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, because it's still, I mean, you definitely have to climb up there, right? Although I wouldn't think you have to do a whole lot to this thing, right? Looks not like not too too much. You do have to clean out the plates, and yeah. uh, that's about it. Looks like a big old submarine to me. Uh, the uh, residential and commercial, another question that I almost breezed right past, and you said, no, no, there's, there's a residential and commercial aspect there. It's mainly about where you want to build um, yeah. because – uh, residential it can be kind of an issue, especially with the black mold uh, that grows on alcohol. Oh, wow. um, so explain so, that. So, so why, it's, go it's a uh, it's a bacteria that really likes alcohol. I can't remember the name of it right now. Right. Uh, but usually, like you look around the distilleries and the warehouses, that's why warehouses are usually black. Uh, if they're not black, then they just pressure washed it. Uh, yeah. So it really uh, gums up everything. Like. My truck, it's covered in distillery mold, still from wild turkey. Oh, so that's the mold you're talking Yeah, because I like Bargetown. You know, Bargetown, Kentucky, folks, it's a great town. Uh, very, very known for bourbon, but we do a lot of work out there, and a lot of the houses are just are covered in just black, brown. So usually the uh, the distillery has to either pay to have people's really? stuff <laughs> pressure washed, and that's usually only if they ask for it. All right. Um, but they have to offer some kind of solution for that. Wow, that's crazy. Uh, and that's usually a lot. Of, uh, one thing that gets overlooked pretty good, uh, usually a lot. Uh, then if you do, like, non-residential, like out here, big problem is going to be your trucks coming in yeah. uh, on back roads. And right. our, especially here, we got two different bridges. 
one's a 27 ton bridge the other one's an eight ton bridge and you got to make sure they come around to the right side and so they're yeah. not uh breaking dot laws yeah so re- so i'm still wrapping my head around residential distilling it, it so you're talking about like people can distill out of their homes so you can actually get a license uh a fuel license and be wow. able to distill That's but it crazy. has to be denatured where you can't drink it oh, but wow, you do get checked pretty often yeah so do people do that? I mean, do you know people that have distilleries in their houses? I mean, not distilleries, but they'll right. they'll moonshine for sure. Right, right, right. Uh, you can drink that though, right? I know my oh, yeah. aunt. My aunt does that too. <laughs> um, all right. As far as tech influence, uh, I know you had mentioned, uh, especially in the bigger things, bigger places, automation is becoming very popular. Um, guess, can you explain to our listeners a little bit of, of that world. Uh, like this went to a conference, ADI. Uh, American Distilling Institute, um, went to a big trade show there. A uh, lot of controls going on the steel to help control steam. Like, everything here is uh, not automated. It's all manually done. Uh, but they have, like, automation for steam valves, for uh, your temperature of your vapor coming off, how much water you're putting into your condenser, uh, into your death meter, uh, proof coming off, be able to change that. And so it, it's a lot of automation going on there. Um advancements in boilers um bottling stuff i mean it, it's they're always coming up with new ways to make everything a lot more efficient so it's does it help with safety um it does it depends on like in what size yeah. uh usually the bigger bigger the company the more money they spend the bigger machines they have more quantity more production yeah more people like, to get hurt uh, there while turkey uh, worked on palletizer and depalletizers uh those are some pretty big heavy machines that can crush someone pretty quick. Oh, yeah, I guarantee it. So um, is it a danger? Is a distillery, big or small, a dangerous place to work in? Um, depends on how cautious you are. Yeah. And if you actually follow the guidelines for, like, lockout, tag, uh, tag out. What's that? Um, so if most of your stuff is going to be air-actuated stuff. It's, so it's you got to kill your air to it, and you got to put pins in. So if it does give out, that it's going to hit that pin and stop instead of just going oh, wow. on down and uh, either – Causing serious injury or death. Yeah. Um, smaller places, there's really not. Just don't be oh, an idiot, basically. Yeah, that's kind of um, life in general, right there. Uh, the uh, so as far as with the automation, uh, do you find does it does it lessen the bourbon? Do you find it to be a bit more generic? I mean, do you find like as far as making something by hand versus having a machine come in and take it over? I mean, do you as a master distiller, do you think? Ah, uh, it, I think it does take away some aspects of it. Uh, if you're going for consistency, I mean, it's great. But I think the small human error stuff that makes bourbon a little bit different each time is yeah. kind of the unique mystic yeah. uh, aspect of it that a lot of people like. Uh, well, you had mentioned that to me, in fact, because we when our, in our pre-interview, you had, you had said as far as, you know, it's if I if – I, tweak this one a little differently this time it, you know the whole the whole barrel will taste that way but it, it'll it'll be different from the other ones right there, there's just so many variables too it goes yeah. in the bourbon that you couldn't especially on a pot still you're not gonna be able to replicate it exactly every single time yeah so there's always gonna be sm- some small aspect even if you get the cook fermentation and distillation all this exact same the barrels you're going to use are going to be completely different yeah um there's a lot that goes into the wood that's been cut down so what was growing around that tree at that time? Wow. How old was that tree? Yeah. What region did it come from? Uh, the, what kind of climate was it going through? So I assume you got to watch what kind of wood you buy then, right? Um, I mean, a lot sense. of people will go inspect the wood, um, yeah. especially mainly for, like, uh, bug damage because you yeah. get some bug damage wood. Uh, it'll start leaking everywhere. Wow, really? And is that the same with the with the barrels as far as the wood? Like, if the yes. wood is bad, barrels, yeah. same thing? Yeah. Oh, I was thinking about the the wood you were burning to. Uh, oh no, but, that doesn't matter. Oh, okay, that's, okay. That's, that's what I was like, man. That's, you guys are really specific about this stuff. So you no, it's whatever fits in the in the, uh, in the hatch okay. there. That's, all right, that makes more sense. Um, the all right. So with with all of your years and years of experience, uh, what would you say is one of the craziest things you've seen, or just a good learning experience that you've pulled out of this out of this industry? Um. I think the good learning experience that I've had, especially being small first and then going to a large distillery, then back to a small again, is getting learning scope of things, especially starting the smaller side, then going to a large side, then seeing how I could be more efficient here, then coming yeah. back and then applying those things yeah. here yeah, has yeah. been really useful. Then being at a small place where the first 
uh, six years, I was here by myself, basically. It was just wow. me and the owner. Yeah. Um, so I had to do everything. Yeah. So it made me learn how to do a lot of skills that I didn't have before. Heck, yeah. Well, that forces you to learn. I mean, if you're if you're doing it all, I mean, that gives you uh, – it makes you learn everything. Um, so do you ever get lonely? Working by yourself? Well, you got bring, bring, bring the dogs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dogs, and as you say, a cat running around. So. Yeah, well, well, sometimes those are the best coworkers you can have. Um, uh, what would you say, give me one pro, one con of being a master distiller? Uh, let's see. Con, uh, it's going to be your hours. Uh, yeah, it's, heck yeah. It's a lot of hours. I mean, there's some times yeah. where I can – just put in a 40, and I'm happy to yeah. deal with that. But there's other towns I'm putting in 120, 130 hours oh, a week. Oh, goodness. So it's just kind of what you make of it and how what your aspirations uh, yeah. for production are really going to be. It also depends on your equipment a lot, too. Yeah. Um, so what would you say one pro is? I pro, lines, I mean, I it's, uh, it's a fun job. And like I said, the pro here is, especially being a, the a smaller distillery, it's – there's not a lot of monotony to it. Yeah. There's always something different going on. There's always something else that needs to be done that's going to be a little bit different, that's going to be fun, maybe something I haven't done before, so I get to learn something else new. Oh, yeah. Um, but meeting the people, beating yeah. people is always fun. Well, you got these big tour buses coming in and, and all of these different people, and they all want to know your story and how you do all of this stuff. And that's got to be fun, I would think. I would think that would make the time go by. It does, you know, but then also when you start messing with them, then it gets behind on your work. And that's what <laughs> yeah. that's when that day starts stretching yeah, really quick. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and then when, then when podcast people come in and hold you after hours and ask you all these questions, um, the all right. Well, we're going to jump into your history, um, which uh, you had mentioned earlier with a smile on your face that you were a moonshiner, and I'm dying to hear this story because uh, in our pre-interview you had brought it up, but that's kind of as far as we went with it. Uh, and you are a graduate of UK, and, and you're a very educated man. Um, but walk us through your your beginning Elliot Ness days. <laughs> um, so going to all through my life, I always played baseball. So uh, I got an offer from a college, Union College, down in Barberville. Uh, it's about 20 minutes east of Corbin. Right. Uh, so I signed my letter and intent to go play baseball there. What position? Uh, pitcher in third base. Oh, man, those are both tough And spots. then, uh, so I got down there, did not realize it was, it was a dry county. It's oh. wet now, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's kind of weird going back down there and there's liquor <laughs> stores everywhere uh, around campus. Uh, but when I was down there, it was dry. And the uh, closest beer was in Richmond. So that's 45 yeah. minutes up the road. Yeah. Or I go to Virginia, it's 9 or 10 minutes, or 9 or 20 minutes, go down to Tennessee to the Rick and Boost, and it's just a little pizza joint that would serve uh, pitchers of beer, and it's never ID'd. <laughs> so it was a track to get any alcohol. So one day I kind of got fed up with it and uh, said I'm just going to make my own alcohol. So really just got on Google and looked up how to make a pressure cooker still and really? started distilling in my dorm room. Wow. And why, like... Why bourbon over anything else? I guess it was easier or? Well, it's just moonshine. So you're not making any bourbon. You're just making clear Oh, that's clear right. Spirits. I'm sorry. Moonshine. Yeah, yeah. So what's the, so what's moonshine? What's the makeup of moonshine? It's usually just cornstarch, sugar, and that's about it. Yeah. Wow. That's, now you can do it because uh, I will not say her name, but my aunt has different jars of moonshine at time, peach and apple and mm -hmm. everything else. I guess, how do you, I guess you flavor it with just, you drop some you peaches can, You can there. flavor just about anything, but yeah. usually I just soaked it clear. Man. So did you pay, I mean, did you make a living off of moonshining? I pay, help pay the tuition. Heck yeah, good for you. I appreciate that. Um, so did you, I guess you, how'd you market it? Uh, it's not hard to market when you're <laughs> the only one that really has it. So. Yeah, that's true. What am I thinking? And usually, yeah. usually it's, it all stays on campus too. So yeah. it's, it's, once you're, you're in one of the sports, uh, one of the sporting groups, so then, all the other sports, the football team, the volleyball yeah. team, the basketball team, will all kind of come to you Heck once yeah. where it kind of gets out. So we were just like the man on campus? No, you, you got to keep a low profile, too. Oh, yeah. So that's what I was going to ask. So you never got never got caught? No. And where did you – did you do it in your dorm room? or the dorm room, first year. Then after that, I went to an uh, off-campus. Oh, man, you expanded. Uh, so do you need a lot of space to do this? I mean – Depends on the size you want to do. Yeah. Um, it, you can do it in a pressure cooker and a sink, and wow. there you go. That's okay. And how much were you cranking out per week, per month? So usually it's maybe 25 quarts. Yeah. So it's not, not a lot, but yeah. 
when they're going for 50 bucks a quart. That's what I was going to ask. That was my next question, yeah. And you use that to pay for most of your college. Uh, well, baseball always you know, like baseball paid half, and then you yeah. paid the other half. Heck yeah, that's awesome. But you got a degree, no no cost, and you learned to. Well, I, had, I had to pay for the other ones. So once I started moving around a little oh, bit. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. That's gotcha. when I got out of it for a little bit. Yeah, well, you, but I tell you, that's a valuable business. Although it's a business class right there, what you were doing, and, uh, and I learned a lot about economics really quick. <laughs> yeah. Supply and demand, and uh, so I assume you never saw a de- decrease in demand. A bunch, no. of, a bunch of thirsty college kids. I think uh, about last year, it ended up going moist, which is where you can buy it in restaurants. Oh, and man. then and I was still underage, so I couldn't still yeah. get anything. Did that hurt business? Not really. Oh, okay, well, good. Good, good, good. Um, the, and, all right, so you moonshine, you got through that, um, and then did you go straight from, from UK into Wild Turkey? No, actually, I went to uh, Marshall University for like six months. Oh, okay. And I decided I was going to end up in jail up there. And then went, Why? Came, what? Exact, uh, came back back home pretty All quick. Right. So what happened in Marshall? Uh, there's, a, there's just way too many bars up there. Oh, okay. So nothing to do with the bourbon so industry. No, no, just, no, the bourbon industry at <laughs> just all. Just the drinking industry, right. Gotcha. So, yeah. But then I, uh, then I came back here and went to Kentucky State University. Okay. Uh, and I was in the Oak Country Research Center, and I was a, a researcher there, mainly studying paddlefish. Yeah. Uh, but I was on grant money, so that grant money oh, ran good. out. Yeah. And they're like, you can still work here, but we can't pay you. Yeah. I was like, I'm yeah. going to go find something else to do. Yeah. It's, and you, grant money is, you know, you don't live real high on grant money. No, it, it's your bare bones. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, you're doing it. But it was, it was fun. I mean, yeah. it, it, I was on a boat for yeah. four to five days a week and always electric shocking or gill netting or something like that. And it's always really fun. Yeah. I think that's amazing. It, well, actually, because we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later. You're working at the fishery. But after you told me that, I said, I was like, man, Hunter, you're a scientist. You know, you think about all that you're doing in, in the fishery and then the distilling. I mean, you're, I mean, you're, you're like a personable scientist. So good for you. <laughs> uh, it's, I, it, I guess. Um, uh, yeah. But it, it was, it was always kind of fun to, because fishing's always, fishing and hunting's always been one of my passions, yeah, and yeah, that was yeah. an easy way to incorporate that into my life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. yeah, it was uh, very different uh, yeah. until Grant Money ran out. Yeah. You got to move on. So tell us about your wild turkey experience because you were there. Uh, I was there for three years. Three years total, and you were a manager at one point, and, and you had to do different things. So yeah, I was a crew leader. I was material handler. Uh, worked on the line, uh, bottling line. Uh, it's kind of all, all aspects of uh, the process, trying to get a feel for everything. Uh, but yeah, it was it was a great experience to be able to see all that and yeah. work all different kinds of uh, spots and interact with different people too. Yeah. So were they a good company to work for, would you say? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, good relationship with uh, oh, yeah. Wild Turkey. I mean, I met my wife there. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. And she still works there, right? She still works there. She works in a quality lab. Yeah, and what is – explain real quick what a quality lab is. So they're mainly doing, like, RDNA, so they're checking proofs, uh, oh, yeah. checking salinity, and just making sure the overall quality of the bourbon or any vodka or anything that they're bottling at that point is up to snuff a certain standard and right. then also checking your materials too like your knockdowns and your glass yeah so do you ever i'm curious as far as with quality control and and do you ever have you ever put out a, a batch that you're just like nope it's no good dump it or is it so calculated i mean it'll be different but it'll always be good how does that work um usually you can just spend more time let it age in the barrel longer oh, and okay. it'll usually turn around yeah. uh but as far as something that's just so bad that I don't want to give anybody, uh, you just basically read still it. Yeah, you just give it to your in-laws. To make hand sanitizer <laughs> out of it, what a lot of people did. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that works. I guess. I mean, I guess I'm sure it works. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, that was a good way to pivot, you know what I mean, when, when COVID hit and all that. I remember um, I remember actually you guys gave me some of those bottles of that. I remember that. Uh, the... Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. again, yeah, people are trying to get into this place. Uh, Good luck to that. But yeah, if you know anybody that wants ninety-five gallons, uh, I know, well, honestly, I still have some at my house because I, I think you all gave me three or four bottles. I was like, man, I don't. This will last me a while, but uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll I'll keep an ear open. Um, so we know while you were in school, you're very industrious and, and, and entrepreneurial. Um, but as far as it, your overall. Uh, student build you know how were you your ideas on college you know your take on things uh 
it's all going through high school. I was straight A student, everything. Oh, nice. Got to college, and then that's where I got really that's, lazy. That's where you, you started when, 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 when there was no <laughs> real structure other than baseball. Yeah, just kind of let it all go to the wayside, and then kind of had a come to Jesus moment, and it's yeah. like, oh, I need to you get need, it together. You need to get it together. Um, but uh, as for school, my views on school. Uh, I think college is just a necessary evil right now because everyone, to get a good job starting out, you need a degree. Yeah. Um, are people with degrees always the best choice no. over other people? No. Um, basically, right now, I just view college as just showing that you can show up for four years, basically, put your time in, do your work, meet deadlines, and it just shows you have a little certificate saying that. That's basically yeah. what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with that. And it be is. in debt. Yeah, and be in debt. I know it, it's so. Uh, but you left college with no debt, right? Yeah, and I actually I, I paid it off two years after I left college, so it oh, wasn't good terrible. You. Yeah, it didn't haunt you forever. No, it's crazy. I have friends. I'm 43, and I have friends that still have college debt, and it's it just boggles my mind. Um, I'll start taking away from your tax return. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, I mean they'll get it. They they never. Stop asking for it. Um, although maybe I should tell him to start moonshining. Um, the as far as um, role models, I know you and your dad are very close, and, and he has been in the trades, and he has a heavy. Well, actually, he was. What did he do before the heavy equipment? He did. So he, 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 he built houses for. Built houses. Uh, this was thirty five years. Uh, oh, wow. Then his dad, my grandfather, also built houses too. Oh, okay. Um, that's how he got into it. So do they drag you? I assume they dragged you. Oh, I, I was. I remember being six years old picking up rocks in the front yard yeah just throwing chucking them in a pile <laughs> and that's really and, and sweeping houses yeah. uh, so i was always well, on the job you, side though. so yeah. but then as soon as i hit that 10 year mark then i can actually get in a bobcat and work around the bobcat oh wow, so, I bet that was amazing so that was that was a lot better that was a very good graduation at, at there. 10 uh, 10 years old yeah so it's always clearing roads uh did not do any finishing work just mainly move this pile of dirt over here Oh, and that was man. mainly what That's I would do. Awesome. So, I would mean, love that, though. So, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, I didn't have any physical labor oh, anymore. Oh, my gosh. And then, like, I mean, my daughter's almost 10. I could not imagine putting her in a bobcat. <laughs> it's, well, it's, it's one, it didn't have, like, the joy cons. You know, like, it's the, right. you get to choose yeah, things. So, still, I mean, that's it wasn't, it wasn't as bad, and you had your feet pedals. So, yeah. it, was, it wasn't terrible, but yeah, yeah. we always had the lawn, uh, lawnmower with the same steering. So, yeah. it wasn't too de- terribly yeah, different. Pretty, yeah, just a little more, little more horsepower. Uh, so, then you, your dad shifted into, I think you said after the 2000s. 2008 recession he, right. he went into the uh heavy just heavy equipment uh did you have you ever helped him with that or yeah so I, going out anytime i was back from college or uh even when i was uh working here I, anytime he needed extra hand i'd always go out with him uh for either work the track or uh backhoe or uh high lift uh load him up with dirt then he'll take off the dump truck and then come back and load yeah. him back up again nice. just mainly stuff that he needed an extra hand with right. i got there yeah, with him yeah. So what is like heavy equipment? Um, what I assume he mostly does commercial work, or what? What kind of work? Mainly does he residential. Do? Oh, he does do residential. So just kind of uh, flattening lots and that kind of thing, or, uh, or that land footers. Uh, does a lot of uh, grading work. Oh, um, okay. He's been uh, bust up concrete a lot, and pour new pa- uh, pour new pads. Um, it's kind of anything that has to do with heavy equipment. It's basically what he's been doing here right. lately. Nice. And as far as overhead on that, man, again, going back to my, my growing up on a farm, you know, my uncles had combines and they had these six figure tractors. And I always thought to myself, even at a young age, how do you all make money? I was like, I'm looking at the, the overhead, you know, is, is that a, I mean, how, I mean, does he lease them? I mean, I know, I mean, I know you can't go out and just buy out, right? These three, $400,000 earth movers. I mean, how so does that it's work? Where he's building houses mainly. So when yeah. you're, when you're building houses, especially in the nineties, when things were booming, booming and especially even early two thousands, yeah. uh, you make a pretty good chunk and you can end up buying all your equipment. Oh, okay. and, and that I, way it's as soon as that recession hit in 2008, yeah. uh, you're kind of have that there yeah, that you can say. rely on. And it almost be an asset anyway. You right. Think about it. uh, and I would think that those are, those pieces of equipment last a long time, right? They do. Uh, but then, like, you have, like, a pump go out and a high lift, and you're looking it's at $15,000. Like, yeah, I was going to say, like, $10,000, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so what would you say, especially in the beginning, and you're from piling up rocks to, to skid skiers to – to being a master distiller, your your life in the trades, what would you say it has taught you? 
don't expect anything. Yeah, Always for free. Expect, expect to put in the work for I, sure. Yeah, I agree, man. Uh, and just it's not just time, but when you're at home by yourself, read up on that skill or whatever yeah. you're doing. Uh, always try to learn more because yeah. there's always always more to learn. You never really know it all. 100%. I couldn't agree with you more. And we've said that a bunch on this show. It's just never stop learning. You know, and, and it doesn't – and I don't mean that in, in a traditional classroom. You don't have to be in a classroom to learn. I mean, think about this. Your office is a classroom. I mean, think about all the stuff that you do every single day. Um and it and it ever changes and and you you can adapt it and it's just it's applied science, really. You think about it. Um, so as far as uh, the stigma in the trades, you know, this is our almost twentieth episode, and I have asked that question to everyone, and everyone instantly says yes. There's a stigma. So I'm not going to ask you that question because I'd already asked you that question. You said yes. Um, so my question you to you, which is I just changed this for you today is how do we change the mindset? How do we get rid of that stigma, in your opinion? I think it starts with the employer. Um, yeah. Actually giving people without that those degrees and stuff like that actually a shot to show up and do their job, and yeah. most of the time they're going to doing it better because yeah. you have more of those life skills that apply to that job versus just book knowledge. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And it, it's – and, you know, the other thing, too, I, you know, it was really cool. We had a um, – I interviewed a lieutenant colonel in the military, the U.S. Army, and he was talking about, you know, there's a lot of trades in, through the military, mm-hmm. and, and he was saying, you know, it's he gets sick of people referring to the military as a last resort. And, and I've thought a lot of that. I think, I think that about the trades, too, is that, or I don't think that, but you hear a lot of times, well, if, if you don't do this, this, and this, you're going to wind up in the trades. And I think that's a mentality we've, we've got to get away from. Um but I would think with your, again, rock star job, I, I, do you not, like me as a window and gutter cleaner, I go to a party, people don't want to talk to me for about that. Um, sometimes they don't want to talk to me, period. Um, but you you go to a party and boom, Hunter, he's the dis- master distiller. I mean, so do you, do you have a different experience with the trades and a different uh, perception? Um, usually I don't try to like broadcast oh, who I right. am because, yeah, because I, cause I don't blame you, right? Yeah, be, because it's one, it, you don't know how they're going to take it. Yeah. Um, and I like to think that I like to stay pretty humble. Yeah, yeah, no, you're a super humble because guy. Because it's, because it, it's one of those things it's, you start spouting off about it and you think that you're just trying to brag about yeah. it. But, um, I kind of forgot the question already. Uh, well, just do you think, given your your status in the trades world, uh, do you do you not feel that stigma when you tell people what you do? Um, not as much, but then you go to the other side of it, to the bigger side, then you do see it. Yeah. Um, especially like if you're on the bottling line or in the warehouse yeah. or something like that, then mm-hmm. you kind of see that. But still, you're it's different subject, different uh, tiers, different tiers, yeah. and then also you got your uh, temporary workers there too that's trying to make it to that full-time position too that yeah. so that's, there's always like yeah, in life there's, there's always a hierarchy oh yeah and there's always somebody looking down on you you know what i mean no matter what you do um and you can't get away from that and oh, well i don't think i think at any any point in anyone's life no matter what your profession is there's always someone else out there doing that too so oh yeah it's, it's then, one of those things you can't even just think about you can't and you can't compare yourself to other people you know you just have to do your best in your own world people who compare uh, themselves against other people usually pretty unhappy they are always unhappy because they can always find somebody that's better than they are there's always someone bigger you know? better smarter <laughs> yeah faster. And, it's, and, and and especially nowadays social media people lie about mostly who they are anyway so then people are comparing themselves to that but that's its own show we will not go down that rabbit hole but we will use that as a segue into our third and final segment and so basically, how can someone join your trade? So, and, and I'd like to start with, I kind of break this down into both if you work for yourself and then also working for a company. Um, and let's start with working for a company because you have experience with both. Um, working for a company, questions to ask your employer, things to look for in a distillery that, that would be a, a either a red flag or a, and a, a thumbs up. Um, so... All of it's you got your bigger, uh, bigger guys that's been established for a while, All right? But then you got your smaller guys that are just getting started out. So the problem with usually the smaller guys, if they haven't been there for 
three to four years where they're actually going to start having the age product come about, you'd be worrying about are they going to be able to make it to that point to where they can start making capital back. Right. Um, that's where you see a lot of distilleries die. Um, oh, is from uh, not having enough capital. They'll invest yeah. all this money into building it, uh, hiring a bunch of people, and then start producing, but then they can't make it to where that stuff they produced that first year actually comes to age where they can actually make money back. Yes. And that's when they run out of capital and they end up selling everything. Oh, wow. So, yeah, because that's what I was wondering. Like, you start, you got to wait. Just like you said, you have a, a two-year wait. You know, you can't. So a lot of people make gin and vodka. That's oh, yeah. what they'll do. They'll okay. sell clear spirits so they can kind of supplement in oh, or they'll yeah. do uh, flavored stuff. Yeah. And they'll do a lot of co-packing. That's a whole other thing, too. Yeah. Uh, to kind of supplement that income and so they can't it, make it that far. Yeah, But some people go way too big too quick, and that's yeah. when they will sputter out and run out of money. Wow. And have you seen that recently with any of these distilleries around town? Um, not around here. Uh, usually it's out of state. Uh, I think Why? last year there was four or five that went down. Yeah. Um, just like I said, they just kind of run out. And some people, uh, some of them rely on tourism and with coronavirus, it kind of killed it. So yes. uh, that's when they'll start going under. Yeah. And that's when you can find some pretty good prices on Yeah, equipment. I was going to say, that's kind of crazy because I guess they have to liquidate mm -hmm. uh, and, and you all... Although, would you get sidetracked here, but would you feel comfortable reaching out to another distillery and buying their bourbon? I mean, being that you have your recipe and, and your take on things, would you, um, would you take not it? Not for us, but for other clients that we co-pack for. Um, oh, we yeah. have done that. I mean, that's, they source from other places, too, and they'll bring it here, then we'll house it, and then we'll bottle it for them. Wow. So that's its own industry. So, yeah, so that's the co-packing yeah. side. Yeah. Wow. So that, uh, is that its own, like, can... Could someone, could, could someone in this industry just be a, a co-packer? Yeah, I mean, there, there's plenty of places that do that right wow. now. Interesting. So then I guess going all the way back to our first question, um, those considering working for a company needs to need to look for stability and longevity <laughs> as far yes, as... Yes, <laughs> uh, but those are one of those things that you're not really going to be able to see because yeah. that's going to be some of the numbers. If you ask about numbers, they're going to kind of write you off pretty quick anyway. So uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It, I think that'd be, it's a, kind of a hard thing to find out. Yeah, uh, yeah that's interesting. Um, well, that's, in I, that's another world I, had, I didn't even know it existed. Um, so as far as working for yourself, um, which is... Like, kind of honestly, it's, again, it's hard for me to wrap my brain around, like, because a lot of the, you know, the, a lot of people we have on the show, okay, you can start a, a you know, a, a plumbing company on the side, little overhead, you can start an HVAC company, but to, to start a distillery, you know what I mean, it, it's, that's a different world, um, and, I, and I, just looking around here, I would think the overhead would be overwhelming, but how, how would you start I mean, if someone listening to this podcast left inspired, they're they're done making moonshine in their closet, and they say, "I'm going to get to the good stuff." Uh, where do they start? Be one, be finding a backer. Yeah. Um, so so it, it's it's a uh, there's a lot of money for all your materials coming in. Uh, yeah. Just your still itself, it's usually pretty costly. You're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Uh, even your cooker right there, you're looking over a hundred thousand dollars. Wow. Uh, all the equipment goes in it. Even the fermenters are usually uh, ten to fifteen thousand dollars a piece. Um, then not just that, but then all, you got all your plumbing. It goes to it. Um, yeah, oh so yeah. So usually your plumbing is right around twenty to thirty thousand dollars. And just your square footage. And I mean, think about how much space you need. Usually that's number houses. one. Like if you're going to start a distillery, you're going to need a place. You need a either own the place or you have to have a long term lease. All right. And um, then once you have that, then you have to submit all these plans. Uh, to zoning and uh, to get approved by the county, then you can apply to for your DSP. And DSP stands for what? Uh, it's your distilling permit. Oh, okay. Uh, and then, do you need um, like I know you could come in and just build a distillery, and I know uh, Walter, the the owner of this place, he and his wife Dana. Their Dana is she I mean, she's an architect and builds distilleries for lots of people so i know there's companies out there doing that but do you have to as far as certifications and licenses do you have to bring those companies in do you not have to it's recommended i guess but it's usually recommended especially it yeah. depends on your experience with it um, yeah. um it just it just kind of depends on how big you want to do it because uh, there is other things with explosion proof stuff um uh safety regulations that you have to uh, adhere to uh, and if you break those, then you won't be approved. Yeah. And then, so so is OSHA a big factor in your life? Uh, not 
too much here, uh, but definitely there at uh, Wild Turkey, it was yeah, it was oh, pretty pr- pretty big part because yeah. uh, a lot of that also has to do with being ISO certified. Yeah, uh, don't know what ISO means, but yeah, uh, th- they had four different ISO certifications, so that's usually like a food safe thing, um, right. and so very strict on a lot of things. Oh yeah, I'll guarantee so it. So it, it was a uh, different different world over there. So do you have? I'm curious th- in this. In this distillery, any distillery, um, do you have to deal with OSHA and also like the food and beverage? I mean, do they do they so both come in? Got the TTB and the uh, ABC. Yeah, oh, they're yeah. mainly the oh, governing I didn't think bodies. About ABC, yeah, yeah, they're yeah, the yeah. ones that are over top of you. And they're pretty like they'll shut you down. They're looking. They're looking for the money. <laughs> yeah. That's what they're looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I know they don't mess around. Um, so side. Part-time capabilities, side businesses, if, if someone didn't want to go all in and, and couldn't go all in, is this an industry you could do on the weekend? I mean, I don't. doesn't sound like it. but You can. I mean, it depends on what you want to do. Um, yeah. I mean, there's usually a job, like, if you just want to do it on the weekends, then there's always places for, like, uh, tour guides working at a gift shop and bottling. Yeah. Um, the other uh, sides of stuff like that you can do for sure right and then types of insurance is it i mean apart from general liability insurance that kind of thing is there any specific See, certificate that one for that one oh, okay. See, we yeah. actually just went through changing our insurance so. oh, okay well I'll, I'll hit him i will bring him on the podcast one day um and then last thing as far as if, if you did kind of want to get this stuff going uh, your crews, your help, you know, I know you said you're bringing an assistant. There's all sorts of different people out there, tasters and bottlers. Um, where, how much of a crew would you need? I mean, could you, could a single person do all of this or do you need to think about getting subcontractors? And it depends on what you want to do. Um, like I say, if you want to build your own distillery and r- run it, uh, yes, you can do it by yourself. Um, but you're going to have those long days, 14, 16 hour days. Yeah. And it's going to be very stressful. And especially if you want to take on co packing too. If you just want to focus on the distilling part, yeah, you can do it by yourself. Yeah. Uh, but like, you're not going to be doing a lot of production while yeah. doing that too. And you probably wouldn't be doing tours either. Yeah, yeah. So, and I don't know, maybe we can't answer this question, but co packing and then also distilling, if you were to start it on your own, what do you charge? I mean, I, I mean, does it. There's a lot of variables that go into that. Um, yeah. For distilling, uh, per barrel price depends on grain cost, barrel cost at the time. Uh, if you want anything special done with it in the recipe, uh, there's a lot that goes into that pricing, so it varies quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, then co-packing is kind of the same way, depending on how many labels they want to have on it. Yeah. Uh, any oh, special yeah. Yeah. hang tags or anything like that always adds to price, but usually it's a per barrel price off the still, and it's a per bottle price. Uh, for bottling, for the co-packing. So do you all adjust your prices with with grain prices or or any product that goes into it that goes up and goes down? uh, Do you all have to to accommodate that? We we do have to stay on top of that because, look, uh, I think it was a couple years ago when corn got up to around 30-something cents a pound. And yeah. usually it stays around like 17 cents a pound. Oh, wow. So when it doubles the price, it definitely cuts yeah. into it. And then malt prices, some malt, uh, malt comes from a malt house. And depending on what their supply and demand is, yeah. especially with beer being a booming business right now, it's cut yeah. into the malt supply too. Oh, uh, yeah. So malts went up too. So have you found with all of the craft breweries, is that – hurting the bourbon industry probably not but not really but <laughs> yeah. I, i'm all for it because i love beer too, craft yeah, me beer. too and i love bourbon i just i love beer too um so do do, do the to the do you guys help each other out? Do the beer guys help out the bourbon guys as far as, you know, kind of cross the We kind of do. Uh, and I do. Uh, I end up giving barrels to beer uh, breweries quite a bit. Yeah. Um, talking to them, like talking shop a lot. Yeah. Um, I always like call them quitters because <laughs> they only take the process part of the way <laughs> and I actually finish it. Yeah, so it's right. like the one, the yeah. longest running dad joke in distilling. <laughs> right. um, but, yeah, we try to help each other out a lot. Yeah, yeah. And usually uh, – it's mutual interest. I mean, I yeah. give them barrels, they give me beer. So, yeah, heck yeah. Um, back to the old trading days. Uh, so, would you say beer is easier to 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 make than 
bourbon? Oh, it's a whole different animal. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot more people that homebrew it, but there's a lot more go into your ferment, uh, fermentation because you can't introduce it to oxygen and stuff like that. You can't let yeah. it oxidize. Uh, there's a lot more that goes into the fermenta uh, fermentation side on the brewing side than yeah. the distilling side does. Uh, so I don't know. They're they're unique in Just their own two ways. Two different worlds, yeah. So uh, and we only have we're running out of time. A handful more questions, but um, if you couldn't distill bourbon, would you be a happy? Uh, would you be happy uh, making beer? Would, oh, that, be, would that be a cool cool I, thing to I do? Always joke. Always I always make beer. This distiller's beer. It's usually <laughs> just very sour. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, it's either yeah. way. It's. It's the, fun, just the yeah. craft side of it, and yeah, yeah. having. Uh, I never thought of myself as a very, uh, very artsy person, but then people said what I'm doing is an art. Oh so yeah, I was like, absolutely, hundred percent. I, I kind of get it, but then the more and more I look into it, there is kind of a artistic side to it yeah. that I well, don't really yeah. associate well, think, with myself. Well, no, you should. I think art can be applied to anything. I mean, even writing program can be art, you know, just, it's all relative and how you look at it, I think. Um, so entrepreneurial advice, marketing tips in this world. Um, do you have any for our listeners? Um, as far as if they want to go out or like, I'm marketing asking, for themselves or, well, I'm not asking for trade secrets, but like, and, and the reason I specifically touch on marketing is, and I've said this multiple times, but, uh, I believe that it's, it's a, it can be a very, um, uh, Misleading industry. I think a lot of times people take advantage of, of new business owners and, oh, you have to do this, you have to do that. Advice, what would your advice be going for those considering this as, as a profession, how to properly market a bottle of bourbon? Uh, it's, it's hard to say like how to because right. we do very minimal marketing yeah i know you guys know you um, it's very mostly, very yeah. very small and usually how people find out about us is through tour groups and people going on a uh going to like mint julep or kentucky bourbon boys a tour group like that bourbon yeah. excursions and then they'll come here and then that's how they find out about us and then after that they'll come back next year yeah. without that tour uh tour group yeah, yeah. and just kind of be a be a patron that way um but Marketing, I don't know. Like we haven't really done that much. I mean, like Wild Turkey, they have uh, Matthew McConaughey. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Jim Bean has Malcolm. Right. Yeah. I mean, so that's that's what been their big side. Yeah. So uh, so basically, we all need to get Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> well, she's, if, he's, if we he's, he's a cool guy. Right? Yeah, so he's he cool. So, so we uh, at Wild Turkey, we did the turkey drop one year. Uh, yeah. I was there, and that's where we bought everyone in Lawrenceburg. Uh, a turkey, a butterball turkey. Oh, cool. And then we yeah. delivered it the door by door. Oh, that's cool. And that was pretty cool. Uh, when it honestly sounds like what you just said earlier is a little bit of marketing advice in that just personally network and get in on it. sounds like, and also try to get in with the bourbon tours. Um, yeah. Networking you know, is like, yeah, just like any job is any networking job. is a, a very big aspect of it. And it LinkedIn is. is a great way to do that. Too. Yeah. In fact, I had note about that as far as I know you said LinkedIn specifically was pretty specific with, yeah, like where you can input what kind of jobs you want to be sent to your email, and you get hundreds of job, jobs that's postings every yeah. single week. Interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, all right, one of our very last questions, and, I, and we know the answer, but if, if you could kind of walk us through a couple minutes, because I thought, I th honestly, we could do a podcast on this alone, but if you had to choose another trade, what would it be and why? Uh, and I know you said the fishery, um, but just in – couple minutes explain what that is i mean you're basically like growing fit you're like fish farming right yeah so uh so at k-state uh research aquaculture research center um so it, it's top five in the nation for aquaculture research which is kind of surprising for being in kentucky most of the other ones are down south or on the coast doing muscle stuff um but uh I always had interest in fish and i thought hey i can learn a lot more uh, about fish this way and apply that to fishing which yeah. didn't really end up happening, but right. uh, going there, uh, going to class about like uh, fish diseases and yeah. learning about habitats, uh, what do you prefer? Um, I mean, I don't think it would go on, on or anything. It, it's it's I mean, it's it was pretty in depth, a lot more in depth than I thought it was going to be. Did you go salt water versus fresh water kind of um, stuff? Too? So that's what I always wanted to be growing up was a marine biologist. Oh, yeah, like me too. Every, I think everybody every kid at one point. Was, yeah, I said, yeah, yeah. I was like every kid growing yeah. up is like that real, realization that oh, they're not going to be an astronaut. Like, well, I can be yeah. a marine biologist. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I can go play with dolphins and sea turtles uh, oh, all the yeah, time. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 
but it was fun. Uh, I enjoyed it. Like I said, I get to be on the boat for yeah. uh, four or five days out of a week, and gill netting is always fun because you never know what you're going to get in the net. Yeah. Uh, shocking was always really fun yeah. because everything in that path of that boat is going to be coming up to the top of the water so you can net it up. That's so it's always really fun to be able to do that and have experiences doing that. And being outside. And then like you get to work with a lot of different people too because mainly what I was doing is helping people with their theses, uh, oh, yeah. do do- uh, their doctorates and stuff like that. So it's really wow. cool to be able to help with that. Yeah, yeah. nice. I bet that was a wildly great learning experience. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's like it, – because there's people all over the world. It's not just like people from Kentucky. It, there's yeah. people. Uh, we had India, China, Japan. Um, of course, we have Cana- uh, Canada, uh, South America. Like it was all over the place, and it was yeah. really cool to be able to have uh, those unique experiences. Then we always hung out together and always yeah. got to talk against uh, cultural differences and yeah, yeah. Heck yeah. always make food. It was always a good time. Yeah, and it's how you learn. It's how you learn. You meet, you know, get out and meet people, folks. Um, well, man, that that is about all I have for you. Um, you're a wonderful person, wildly intelligent. Um, you're a great representative of our state, uh, especially with the trades. And I appreciate you being here and, and letting us in your home uh, and answering all of my questions. <laughs> so, appreciate you all coming out. Heck yeah, man. And, and I appreciate the, the little plug of bourbon that we snuck right before the show. That gets me talking. Uh, and listeners, that does conclude another show, and we hope this helps to answer the question of why bluegrass and bourbon brown have become the new black. Another huge thank you to Mr. Hunter Coffee, Three Boys Farm Distillery, and to our listeners. And also, I want to give a little extra love to Speakeasy Podcast Network and Wayne Media, operating out of, operating out of Louisville, Kentucky, and Detroit, Michigan. Uh, this is not an ad, uh, and the, they are not sponsors, uh, but they have become very good friends of mine. Uh, so this is a testimonial for them, because I believe in what they're doing. Uh, they have uh, created an a incredible company and a concept, a concept that takes all of the boring parts out of the podcast and allows me and you, Hunter, to sit here and drink bourbon and just talk. And then somehow, magically, they produce everything after that. Uh, So I'm internally grateful. Um, And also, too, folks just talking about doing trades and staying outside of the classroom. Think about podcasting. Uh, Even if if your reach can't make it to Wayne Media and Speakeasy Podcast, if you're maybe in Sweden, which I realize I have one listener in Sweden. I hope you're listening to this. I don't know who you are, Uh, but that's awesome. Uh, But think about podcasting because it is a wonderful and economical way to promote a positive message, which we all need. Uh, And it's a great way to brand you and or your business. Um, Podcasting is... I believe, where information is going these days, so get on board and teach something. Uh, please subscribe, leave reviews, good ones are preferred, and let us know who, who you'd like to hear from, specific trade, if, or if you'd like to be a guest. Mes- message us on Why the Trades Facebook page. Be safe out there, and I'll see you soon.